Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. yeah, no, that'd be good. Okay. Liz, are we okay with the Liz, video? Liz, are we good with the video? Yes. <laughs> I'm Jenny Morrill and I teach at Colton Paramount Central School in St. Lawrence County. I've been working for many years helping students and teachers learn about the benefits of mindfulness. One in four U.S. students will witness or experience a traumatic event before the age of It's exactly. I just want to make sure because it wasn't up or anything. Okay. okay. So on that note, um, we'll call to order and everyone please stand up. And this morning, uh, Regent Order Kirk will share a moment of reflection. Thank you. And thank you for giving us opportunities to share as close to, to real life situations as we can and bring kids into this austere room and show some of the things that are happening in our districts. You all have listened to my voice for so long. I'm not going to apologize again. It's no better today than it's been for quite some time. <laughs> <coughs> I would like to mention that there's a study that some of you may be familiar with called ACES. It's Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And I've been in so many places where we were talking about the adverse experiences that students were having, whether it was prompted by poverty or other uh, traumatic experiences, and those things can last for a lifetime when it happens at a young, young age. And so I've had the opportunity to engage in conversations in many locations about, we've talked about poverty as one of those issues for so long, but when are we going to do something about it and stop just talking about it? Fortunately, I ran into some other people that had the same thoughts. And in 2016, the Institute for Learning-Centered Education at St. Lawrence University launched a Student Poverty Trauma Initiative. As part of this initiative, the Institute works with teens of two or more from a school, and these people design a plan for educating and informing colleagues about strategies for addressing the unique needs of students raised in poverty and or experiencing trauma for any reason. We actually have a mother who has become a part of many of these sessions that was raised in poverty, started the same cycle for her own children, and she shared very candidly the impact of all of that. The focus on trauma is not only to reach the students in poverty, but also the growing number of students at all levels in education experiencing panic attacks, maybe at college or wherever, and other forms of trauma. A word has spread of successes with this poverty trauma initiative. The Institute has been able to engage more than 30 schools in the North Country and Fairport, New York, in what, its one-year program, which has the strong support of three North Country district superintendents. The focus of this initiative is in providing school staff with practical, easy-to-implement strategies that they can use the next day. A significant element of the Institute program is called mindfulness. It's only one approach, but it's one I've seen on numerous occasions and the impact on students as well as adults. Specifically, it shows teacher strategies they can teach in their, to their students to reduce their stress while in the classroom or at other times outside of school. Educators find value in learning about mindfulness, not only for the use they find for their students, but for reducing the, their own stress as well. Jenny Morrell, who you're going to meet in a moment on the video, is a fifth grade teacher at Colton Pierpont. She has become the go-to person in the North Country for presentations and discussion on mindfulness. In the past year, in addition to spending at least a dozen days working with the teens engaged in the Institute's program, Jenny has given at least another dozen presentations in schools between Lake Placid and Fairport. Any of you know the, know the state? Well, that's quite an expanded area. Also, Jenny is getting increased numbers of requests to work with teachers in their classroom <clears throat> where she can model strategies and coach. A few weeks ago, she spent an entire day in the classroom at the Ohio Elementary School in Watertown, which is Liz's uh, JD. Um, I, I was, I've been there for some of those presentations. <clears throat> And Watertown has gotten a million dollar grant that is helping them fund a lot of initiatives related to this. 
a million dollars in the North Country's big bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to its year-long program working with more than 30 schools, the Institute is in the process of conducting four full-day sessions of pop on poverty and trauma in four BOCES regions. And what I'm excited about now, they've started to invite community agencies in so that networking is spreading from the schools and the response from the communities has been incredibly mm -hmm. positive. So I remind you again, mindfulness, I'm not selling it, I'm just sharing it as the fact that it's, it's a strategy that can help students as well as our teachers. And it's, uh, Jenny is going to, uh, I wish she could have been here today, but we're doing the best we can through video. I think there's a couple spots you're gonna have to listen carefully because the voices are a little faint and they're not, they're not my voices. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two years of my voice will be this. And it depends on the instructions from the person that's leading this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working for many years helping students and teachers learn about the benefits of mindfulness. One in four U.S. students will witness or experience a traumatic event before the age of four, more than two-thirds by the age of 16, and this hardwires the developing brain, impacting cognitive functioning. Research shows that exposure to ACEs increases the risk of developing life-threatening health issues over a lifetime. The early years of development and adolescence are two critical times in brain development. On top of trauma, adolescents are growing up in an era of the 911 generation, where there's increased school violence, economic and national insecurities, social media pressures that lead to disconnection and isolation. We can do simple activities through mindfulness practices that truly do not cost a lot, only some initial training and support, do not take a lot of time out of our day and give young children and their teachers a tool that lasts a lifetime. All of the benefits of practicing mindfulness are directly related to developing executive functioning skills and social emotional learning skills. As a certified elementary school teacher, special education and reading teacher, a certified teacher of mindfulness to adolescents and youth, I have seen the positive impacts that mindfulness has had in the classroom and out of the classroom. To me, mindfulness is an academic intervention. Research supports the practice of mindfulness as a tool to develop the skills that are needed in a school and prepare the brain for learning while it soothes the stress response in our children. Teen stress has now surpassed adult stress. In the American Psychological Association find 30% of teens feel sad or depressed, 31% feel overwhelmed, and 35% feel stress caused them to lie awake at night. Research supports mindfulness practices, reducing these symptoms of chronic stress on the body and mind. And it makes, helps you become aware of the present and the now and things and problems that you're stumbling on and helps you cope with them and move on to a more positive life. Awesome. And so what are you doing with mindfulness in our school? Well, I started a speech for my 12th grade, 12th grade SUNY English class. And then from there, I went to an activity with the whole 7th through 12th grade. And what we're doing is we're teaching the whole 7th through 12th grade how to become aware of not just your own feelings, but everybody else's feelings in a positive way. Um, okay, first, whenever I get upset, I mostly would just breathe in and breathe out. Plus, I'll get like one of these things that helps me, like these little jar things. And then I would just um, shake it up, and then I would just watch it fall to help me relax and lose my thoughts. And then once I watch the um, glitter falls, I mostly talk, and afterwards I talk to Miss Sparkly about like how I'm feeling and what was going on and stuff, so I could let her know about it, so then I can feel better afterwards. Plus, I use, plus I 
think about good thoughts, not bad thoughts about my situation. So when I need a minute, like if I'm mad or something, I just go to a different room or go somewhere else until I relax. Typically, it's just become part of my character. There's, you always have to start somewhere. It's so great that y'all are starting to, to, I guess, be exposed to this at a young age. I didn't get this till I was sophomore in high school. And those, I mean, if anyone's told you about that, but those can be troubling years. How do you feel about mindfulness? I think mindfulness is a great way to help me relax after a long, stressful day and I can't sleep and everything's on my mind and I just relax. How do you feel about mindfulness? I love mindfulness. Um, like when I can't, when I'm not able to do my math homework, it really does help me. Like, say like I'm doing an uh, equation and I don't know how to do it. I just do a little bit of mindfulness, then I just remember. Ready? Okay. Mindfulness gives students the practice of developing skills of connection, present-minded focus, visualization, even relaxation. The pause before responding gets reinforced through mindfulness practices. Just as an athlete practices skills and improves muscle strength through weight training, our mental skills deserve that same attention. All of those skills are linked to developing executive functioning skills. I hope that our schools begin to view themselves as not only a place of learning, but healing too. Our kids deserve it. Not only are children and adolescents learning how to navigate stress with more present-minded awareness and attend to their learning with more engagement, teachers are more connected and productive problem solvers. Teachers are able to intentionally create environments where stress is not an obstacle, where a healthy response to stress is cultivated and practiced, and challenges are met with curiosity and kindness within a learning environment. School is a place of learning and healing, and this is a winning combination for our future. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Regent Rose, yes. say something? You know, actually, thank you very much for that. There's a, a lot of... Uh, I'm Jenny Marlin, I teach at Colton. There's, there's a, lot, <laughs> a lot of research now looking at environmental factors and genetics, and they found that this works through epigenetic influences on messenger RNA, and if it's repetitive enough, it causes changes in DNA, and then that can affect behavior. So it's really important for us too. So. And there's a certain chemical that produ is produced <laughs> right. through the stress. And if you have less stress, you have right. a bad chemical. It's a new enzyme called PK and Zeta. Yeah, and there's another two yeah. too. I can't yeah. think of it right now. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Works. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for really sharing that. That's uh, amazing. I do have to say this is this was so timely uh, given our uh, agenda this month. Um, I think all of us could have used some of these strategies. Um, so again, good morning, and at this time, I want to turn it over to our Vice Chancellor. Madam Chancellor, colleagues, good morning. Good morning. I implore all of us to practice mindfulness to the extent that we can uh, throughout the day and throughout our meetings. 
I move at this time that the Board of Regents convene an executive session on Tuesday, April 10th at 11.15 a.m. to discuss litigation matters. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now uh, we have a presentation on the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission for the Arts. And at this time, Roger, <coughs> Regent Roger Tillis, would you please open this discussion? And Helica? Yes. Okay. Come up here. Oh. I'm about to. I'm about to. I'm done. I'm good. Commissioner, mm -hmm. I'll move. Come here. Okay. Be next one. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know. <laughs> we were going to start today with Brad. Are you ready? Sure. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to start off the meeting and get your attention, and I think we did. Um, <laughs> it won't happen again, I promise. Uh, the, uh, this has been an ongoing um, process. Not the, the standards themselves have been approved by us back in September. Um, there's a lot of work that's taken place since September to now. But we approved the Pathway to the Arts a couple of two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we have had such an outstanding group of people working on this, several of whom are here today, and putting in countless and countless hours to get to where we are. And we're not quite completed yet, but I wanted to make sure that we all knew where we were and on this process. So because I know many people are getting, as I am, um, questions about, are we really serious about this pathway to graduation through the arts? Mm -hmm. Because nothing's happening, or very little is happening. And actually, that's not really true. Um, but, but I think a lot of us don't know what's happening. So we wanted to present this. And I also wanted to take this time to um, the, the person that has really spearheaded this um, vir virtually single-handedly mm -hmm. has been uh, our staff person, Leslie Yolen, who uh, is leaving us desperately leaving us um, at the end of this month, I think. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we had time to give her the credit for, for doing mm -hmm. a lot of this mm -hmm. work, but also to uh, present, all, she's, she's the most knowledgeable person about this issue. And before she left, we, we, need your, we needed your input. But I want to thank you also for everything that you've done for us. So. <laughs> So we're going to start, we're going to give you kind of a roadmap of what we've done, how far we've come, all the things that have been accomplished, and what there's still yet to do. So we're pretty excited about that. So we're going to take you through kind of a timeline. In January 2015, the Board of Regents amended Commissioner's regulations so that students could have greater opportunities to graduation through the 4 plus 1 pathway option. And then that same year, in 2015, the Blue Ribbon Commission of the Arts, its executive committee and nationally recognized assessment experts in the arts gathered, reviewed, and studied assessments in dance, music, theater, media, and visual arts for possible use in New York State. Then, the following year, in March 2016, NYSD approved the AP and the IB arts assessment in the five arts discipline to begin the four plus one pathway. We will focus on the we, we will focus on the availability of these assessments later in the presentation. On April 2016, right after that, New York State, um, New York State began writing its New York State Learning Standards for the Arts in the with five teams of New York State educators from each of the arts discipline. So as you can see, every year there were things happening as we went along. And it's pretty exciting. And then in April 2017, the board 
approved the New York State Strategic Plan for the Arts that included properties in reestablishing the importance of arts curriculum, instruction, and assessment connected to the new arts learning standards and professional development. New York State's Strategic Plan for the Arts includes a detailed report from the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Arts and the arts assessment experts that include recommendations for moving forward with the 4 plus 1 arts assessment in light of the new learning standards for the arts. So that was in 2017, last April. The following these recommendations uh, in the report in July 2017, our assessment office as well as our um, arts office began reviewing the CJO, which you'll hear more about as we continue which was exciting because, as you know, we just approved the art standards. We couldn't move forward with any assessments without having a new standards. The standards, correct me if I'm wrong, the standards that we had prior to this one were from 1996. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of work to be done. So we created, um, these were created to measure students learning at the ninth grade or once a student completes the first unit of high school arts credit requirement. In September 2017, this September, the Board of Regents approved the New York State P-12 learning standards for the arts. So we want to thank you, all the committee for the work, as well as for the board for approving our standards. And then in November, this November that just passed, 2017, the statewide PD began with the support of the New York State's Curriculum Advisory Panel. So you can see all the work that has been done. And when Regent Tillis said it's one person, we only have one person for the arts. He's not joking, we said that this is Leslie and that's it. And even just with Leslie, we have a very big team approach. We have been able to get all this done. Leslie has been very strategic in working with the experts in the field to move this agenda forward. So we're pretty excited about what has been done and you will hear what is to come as we move forward. Leslie, do you want to take it away? So our timeline included the 2017-18 uh, school year as a transition Leslie, year you need a mic. these new standards. With the you need 18, a mic, Leslie. Oh dear. We'll, we'll bring it over. Uh, with the 18-19 school year as full, used for full implementation. And we probably will need the same uh, orchestration on that corner for the presenters when we get there. Um, no, I can see it, because we're all going to uh, take turns here. Okay. As we prepare our education communities to use these standards effectively, it's important to remember the value of professional development in the standards implementation process. So, hmm, here we go. Uh, I want to take a big picture uh, step back for a minute uh, and to remind you all of the ESSA criteria for professional learning. First, that it be classroom focused. For professional learning to have an impact on student learning and instruction, it should center on what guides instruction in the classroom, including the state academic standards and content-based curriculum. Classroom-focused learning also takes into account the students in the classroom, their ages, their abilities, their learning styles, as well as the types of activities and support they need to be successful. It also needs to be sustained meaning that it has to be, uh, occur over a period of time, which allows educators to practice and modify strategies and seek coaching and feedback until they have truly mastered implementation in their classroom. It also should be job embedded. Liz, can I get a, a, a laser on this? The little red one? On the end. All right, I'll play with this later. I got it up on the ceiling, not on the, <laughs> not on the slides. All right, I can, I can do this anyway. So it should be also job embedded, that effective professional learning should be integrated regularly into educators' schedules. It should foster ongoing communication and collaboration among teachers, also addressing the specific needs of the school's student population. It also needs to be data-driven. It's important to collect and analyze quantitative and qualitative data as evidence that professional learning is improving student outcomes and instruction and continues to meet the needs of educators. ESSA also encourages professional development to be teacher-led. A list of NYSED trained <laughs> discipline content providers has been shared with the field and includes art standards writers from each of the disciplines plus administrators and teachers who were turnkey trained through NYSED and each of the arts education associations. 
In addition to the components outlined by ESSA, there's a, str uh, a strong consensus among teacher advocates that it's equally important for professional learning to be teacher-led when possible. It is our intention that trained and certified arts educators provide this discipline-specific teacher training so that the curricular connections and lesson plan alignment are guided and can achieve the breadth and depth intended. NYSED also intends that certified, that trained certified school administrators turnkey the administrative training after attending provided, uh, a session provided by a certified and trained school administrator. A variety of standards resources have been uh, created to uh, support all of this work, um, including the arts uh, implementation guide available on the arts page on our website. Uh, on the link at the bottom of the uh, right-hand page there. Um, and it, this should be very helpful to district administrators as they structure district PD and curriculum <coughs> alignment. <coughs> Specifically, from September through March, we, there have been over 60 professional development trainings across the state. Currently, seven more are scheduled in April and May. These do not include the big five um, sessions. However, uh, they also have uh, PD uh, taking place presented by our trained arts educators on their spring calendars. The department and SCDN are planning summer professional development sessions statewide for teachers of the arts. These sessions still need to be posted on the schedule. They are not included. Not, uh, future uh, sessions are not included in these numbers, um, but there could be an additional nine to 15 more sessions over the summer. In March, there was a NYSED SEDN Arts PD, uh, uh, PD session for administrators, and there are approximately 90 NYSED turnkey uh, teacher trainers for the five arts disciplines. Here is a quote I'll share with you from um, a VOCES arts coordinator regarding the trainings. She says, the presenters were fabulous. She saw the overview section, section several times and each time picked up something new that is important to understand. All the trainers were so well prepared and uh, really brought the discipline specific portions of the training to life through the stories they were able to share from their experiences working with both students and teachers. And I'll tell you from my perspective, it has been absolutely fantastic to see how jazzed arts educators are about sharing these new standards. I think that this kind of professional learning should be documented somehow because it's so inspirational. Okay, back to the um, need for new assessments and the Blue Ribbon <laughs> Assessment um, Experts First Report, which identified 13 recommendations from the Executive Committee's deliberations regarding possible <laughs> four plus one assessments. The department very quickly adopted AB and IP. However, those assessments are not accessible or equitable for all students, so the executive committee chose four additional recommendations to investigate further. Program waivers, portfolio, the commencement general education level assessments, which we call for short the CGEL, standing for commencement general education level, and the IAAP, which stands for the Individual Arts Assessment Plan. The subcommittees for each of these were formed, and today we have the chairs here to share a summary of their findings. Unfortunately, the chair of the um, Program Waivers Committee, Jennifer Childress, is unable to be with us here today, so I'll do her part. Um, their charge was to make recommendations on the proposed waiver um, uh, program waiver option for the New York Arts Pathway assist Assessment System as described in the final report from the um, assessment experts. That report can be found on the Arts Assessment webpage and at the link on this slide. So their um, recommendations were that while the program waivers option has a strong potential to expand the varieties of ways students can earn Regents credit in their arts study, the committee noted two factors that diminished that potential. One, that since most committee members felt that some form of individual student review would have to be an important component of program waivers, the portfolio review option would cover the same students plus more students in a wider variety of settings than the program waiver. Second point was that the investment needed by NYSED to create this applica application process and evaluation mechanism 
for program waivers was not insignificant. An efficient use of limited funds and personnel should focus on options that provide the most bang for the buck. So both of these points indicate that the portfolio option could be a better investment of time, money, and personnel. Um, and it would address more students, um, including those who would benefit from the program waiver, and provide a smoother transition to the individual arts plan described in the expert's report. Next up is the portfolio subcommittee, and we have our co-chairs here with us today. Elise Sobel from New York University Steinhardt School for Culture, Department of Music and Performing Arts Professions, and Robert Wood from Wappinger Central School District, past president of the New York State Art Teachers Association, and my media arts standards writing chair. They will give you the summary from their section. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. To give our pre presentation context, we would like to share the information that as art and music educators, we have extensive PK-12 teaching experience with highly diverse student populations in general and special education. This informs our perspective on the importance of portfolios for students. The charge of the portfolio committee was to develop a process for students to submit their evidence of a pathway level achievement thereby waiving the necessity for a regent's exam. The mm -hmm. portfolio has become an essential form of evidence, essential for college and career readiness, providing a comprehensive picture of student achievement as they demonstrate successful growth over time for lifelong learning. Areas that were considered were some logistical, including types of student evidence to be submitted, how the work was submitted, who reviews the work, and more essentially, the criteria used to judge the work. The portfolio provides a full picture of student achievement in the arts discipline and allows for students to demonstrate learning through various modalities. This process for students to submit their evidence of pathway level achievement is in alignment with our top level universities They're at their undergraduate college entrance requirements where a portfolio can now be submitted in place of standardized testing. <clears throat> Various example, existing examples from each of the professional organizations were examined during in-depth committee meetings in order to create essential evidentiary components in each of the arts discipline portfolios. The recommendations include written work over time, a reflective essay, projects over time, documenting student interest and expertise, on-demand tasks, evidence of a three-year development. And those portfolios are obviously aligned with the New York State Learning Standards for the Arts in all five disciplines. Evidence of achievement includes dated work to show growth over time, process trails of idea development and artistic work, and formative and summative reflections documenting critical thinking during the artistic process. Those are all essential identifications of each of the portfolios. So I have served as the New York State School Music Association State Chairperson for Teaching Music to Special Learners since 1993. Portfolio will provide a welcome opportunity for students with disabilities, language other than English learners, students, language other than English students, students with learning differences, and other underserved student populations to showcase the strengths of their accomplishments. The subcommittee strongly supports the use of portfolio model as a component in the Individual Arts Assessment Plan, the IAAP. The portfolio model will allow for every individual to demonstrate evidence as they progress on their journey in the arts from a student to a professional to a lifelong learner. My name is Katie Coletti and excuse me. Certainly. My name is Katie Coletti and I had the opportunity to work uh, with each of the subcommittees, but specifically led the CGEL uh, work. And I'm going to start off by telling you about the charge to the subcommittee. Again, CGEL stands for Commencement General Education Level. That actually comes from 
the old standards from 1996, it's the achievement level K-9 of every student that we require in New York State, every student um, K through nine, we require learning in the arts. It is something that we pride ourselves here in New York State on because not every state does require that learning. <clears throat> so the charge to the committee, and I'm gonna make sure I have the right one, the charge to the committee uh, was to make recommendations for the adoption or adaptation of previously uh, written assessment materials in order to basically have that um, savings or that bang for our, our buck, if you will, in some of the work that was previously done. So maximizing resources was a great importance to us, and I, I'm sure it is all to you as well. Just to give a little background and go back to something Angelica said earlier, in March 2016, there were two, there were two significant milestones that were mentioned. Um, in March 2016, the AP and IB adoption uh, of the assessments, uh, it was adequate and it was a beginning for our, um, our commission's work under Region Tillis, but it wasn't enough specifically, as Leslie said, because of equity. IB and AP programs are not available to every student in New York State and when we're talking about K through nine learning and those commissioner's regulations that require our students to really have a grasp on that learning, then it was not making the mark, if you will, for the committee. The second milestone in July 2017, in July 2017 the Office of Assessment uh, assigned a staff person, and that was under uh, the Commissioner Stephen Katz's direction, and we thank him for that, to uh, put a full-time staff person from OSA on this work to really review the materials that were here and located, the siege um, materials that were here and located. And I'd like to introduce uh, the person who was assigned that work, Mr. Robert Naditi, and he'll explain some of the work that was done for, uh, the, for, for the department and the Office of Assessment. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Naditi. I looked at the documentation which were stored in eighth floor, and my charge uh, was to look for the elements of validity, reliability, and fairness of this test. Um, when we look at the review the test for the validity, we look at some elements which indicate that the test can uh, measure the objective that is supposed to, to measure. And also, we look at the, if the test is able to measure the different levels of success. With respect to CGELs, uh, we had um, five disciplines, music, theater, uh, dance, and visual art. The test was not made for media mm -hmm. at that time. When I look at um, the information we had, it was uh, clear that uh, experts, subject matter experts, college professionals, arts organization and other professionals participated in uh, looking at the standard and um, they came up with the test specification and uh, test blueprints. The and on that basis, different uh, exams were made and that ensured the validity, both content validity and contrast validity, but participation of those uh, professionals. Test items were written and they were reviewed by school uh, subject uh, experts from schools and colleges. And these particular items that, that were reviewed were field tested into sample uh, schools, uh, into sample representatives from different schools. The results from the student work uh, were analyzed psychometrically to check on the test uh, difficulty of each and every item. The committee reviewing this particular 
uh, exam managed to choose appropriate uh, items by eliminating very difficult <coughs> and very uh, easy items. From there also, the statistics showed the differential analysis <coughs> for people of different ethnicity and uh, different demographic. And that ensured the reliability of this test. Technical manual was not written, but you could see the element of techno technical manual for each and every subject, but there was no overall technical manual. So that was a big criticism for this test. However, uh, continuous review by different experts ensured that bias questions were removed and uh, they came up with a, a test which basically was reliable. Fairness of this test was ensured by policy paper which was written, which was written to, uh, to show how the test could be uh, made so fair by, by putting a, a policy of a test accommodation and uh, mm -hmm. eliminating the bias test, as I mentioned earlier, when the review was done. So the tests were very fair. However, we noticed some limitations, which I cited before. There were no proper documentation <coughs> specifying this particular test. So anybody looking at it could shut it down, but everything was in a historical perspective, came out very well. Now, what do we do at this uh, point? We cannot rely on this test which were, uh, the, which were developed because they were based on old standards. Now, we have new art standards. For us to use this particular test, we have to rematch all the items into the new standard. So that is the next step that needs to be done. And also technical manual and administrative manual need to be developed, which are not developed. After matching these particular items into the new standard, there's a possibility we are going to come with a deficiency in terms of uh, the tests which were developed. In that case, test uh, a professional uh, subject professional should come back together, review and uh, key, uh, kind of develop a new test or new items which can need to be field tested again, analyzed for a new test based on the present curriculum or present standard to be, uh, to be developed. So at this point, we have to real, realign uh, new, th those old uh, item to new sta a new standard, develop, if possible, new items, and go through the process of field testing and develop operational tests which can be used as uh, appropriate tests. Thank you. So just to thank Robert, too, Robert did uh, draft a technical report that is uh, in NYSED's hand. So that technical report now is not a, you know, a mountain we have to climb. We, we have that report in hand. And that process of going through and having teachers align the standards uh, to test items or develop test items based on standards is a process that is inherent in our New York State system and has been over and over, uh, over and over uh, repeated. So the, um, I'm just going to review some of the experts' uh, report uh, that um, it gives point to uh, having uh, the CGEL used as a model for IAAP. Um, it was intended to be a model. The, uh, the CGEL was intended to be a model. Um, it includes both portfolio performance <coughs> items um, and practices, both end of course and through course. Uh, assessment items are in that operational test form that can be uh, revived. Um, and all fields are represented in terms of those content areas. 
um, the developers of CGEL and the Blue Ribbon Commission agree that a portfolio of student work uh, based on ongoing performance to provide a student for a basis for self-reflection is one of the best ways of actually measuring performance. Other, other, I, other pieces that were indicated in the experts report, the CGEL can assist state educators um, and New York State students with a grounding in the arts discipline the student chooses. You may not know, but a student must uh, choose a single discipline to move forward on in the arts. Okay. CGEL should, should also serve uh, as a model for the through course and end of course assessments so that they can uh, qualify for continued learning um, for the pathway. You want me to move on? No, yes. yeah, I have to move back, I'm sorry. No, 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 oh. no, no. Not back, on. Back. Faster. Faster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Benchmarking can be developed. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, the links can also, uh, the, the links to uh, CDOS standards are also possible. And the IAAP can be used as a model of performance for all content areas. I'd like to introduce uh, Bradley Morrison, who is the Director of Cultural Arts for the Austin City School District. He co-chaired the IAAP committee. Uh, good morning. I'll, I'll go quick. Thank you. So, um, the, just I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a background on the process that we went through. This is the IAAP, the Individualized Arts Assessment Plan that students would be doing. Um, the experts laid out a focus group uh, process and a survey process. Um, and we identified uh, a number of school districts from around the state that would represent uh, various different portions. Those schools were the Buffalo City Schools, the Austin A Schools, the Fredonia Schools, the Williamsville Central Schools, Wappinger Schools, Indian River Schools, and the New Rochelle Public Schools. Um, then we examined BEDS data to look mm -hmm. at uh, how uh, the enrollment in various courses to decide which courses and which teachers within those uh, volunteer schools uh, would be focused on. Uh, and the courses that we chose are, are uh, here. These are the most uh, mm -hmm. frequently taught courses around the state. Um, the teachers uh, then led small focus groups with their students, uh, as well as surveys. And uh, at, the, uh, at the moment, uh, we have responses from over 550 students around the state. Um, and we also collected from the teachers uh, through course and end of course assessments so that we would have a sample database of assessments currently being used in the classrooms. Um, the student, student survey and focus group data uh, was collected and significant numbers of student respondents had experience already with portfolio based assessments in addition to traditional written exams. Mm -hmm. And additionally, many students noted a desire for an arts pathway, especially as an option for replacing a required regents examination. Uh, the art teachers uh, were asked to complete their own surveys, and most were in general agreement that a performance-based arts assessment was the best tool in determining growth and mastery for students, and all teachers surveyed felt that offering the IAAP as an alternative regents option was an excellent idea and a long time coming. Some of their responses can be found uh, at the link provided there, and I'm going to turn things back over to Leslie. So our 2017 uh, a report from the Blue Ribbon Steering Committee presents recommendations for the individual arts pathway assessments and assessment processes, as well as the steps in the development and implementation processes of those. In the Office of State Assessments Technical Report, the CGL Assessments, it is recommended that the New York State Discipline experts from the field gather to review the assessment items and to align the items to the new art standards. In order to accomplish this, we have restructured the uh, can't get my uh, uh, the blue ribbon committee um, to include um, a steering committee. This is the white section on the uh, target. There is new to orchestrate the alignment of the CGL assessments and the new standards, thereby creating a foundation and model for the individual arts assessment plan. Mm -hmm. The individual arts assessment plan would utilize both. Uh, end of course and through course assessment practices. 
The commission recommends field testing a capstone project to be developed and carried out within the high school appearance, uh, experience. Students would co-develop this project with the guidance from their arts teacher. The individual arts pl uh, plan includes student reflections on work over time, as well as assessing other indirect measures such as attitudes and dispositions. This system of evaluation is truly on the growing edge and could be used as a model for performance assessment in all content areas. If you remember, our standards now have three levels at the high school, and they are um, kind of outlined in these steps here. This visual illustrates those steps to graduating in New York State through the lens of the new New York State high school achievement levels one through three. The foundation level, which my pointer won't show on the slide for some reason, but the foundation level, the first step here, um, is the one unit uh, required for graduation in New York State. This um, uh, has been called the CGL, Commencement General Education Level in our old standards. In our new standards, it is high school one, the proficient level. The second step is the four plus one. It's the foundation level plus two advanced electives for a Regents Diploma called high school two or the uh, accomplished level in the new standards. And the five unit sequence, our last step here, uh, for a Regents Diploma with Advanced de Designation used to be called the Major Sequence Level, now is High School 3, the Advanced Level. So focusing just on that first step, the Foundation Level, once our practitioners align the assessments to the new standards and they are approved by NYSED as an option for 4 plus 1, then New York State can provide all students an Arts Pathway option. I know this is a lot of information. We have time for a few questions. Do we have time for a few questions? Yes. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, before we take questions, let me just add three things to this. Um, one is the, the committee, the commission, uh, somebody take names because I, I can't have, see. Uh, okay. I have the commission. Uh, I haven't given up that job yet. Met, <laughs> met several. <laughs> You'd like to. Uh, <laughs> they met several times uh, as, a, as a larger group. And, uh, you know, people come from all over the state from uh, the Eastman School and Juilliard and, and Columbia teachers and NISMA. And, and it's really an excellent group. The first two or three meetings really tried to focus on the issue of equity and what is available, because uh, most schools don't have a lot of the things that we were talking about, versus the fact that this is a substitute in the four plus one for one Regis test. And uh, so, yes, most of us wanted to see a, a larger commitment to arts in, in uh, schools, and yet we were constrained by the fact that this is only for substitute for one Regents test. I think what I've seen in the presentation is that there was a balance struck, and, um, and, and there are requirements uh, that are beyond one Regents test, but not the kind of uh, pathway to the arts that starts in elementary school, which a lot of our people wanted to do. This is a first step. Um, the second is uh, the, the regents might want to visit one of the nine or 10 um, PD sessions that you're going to have around the state. And we're hoping to have uh, regional kinds of uh, uh, meetings. And I think it'll give you a better idea of where we are on this. And third, we have never made this a priority in the budget. Uh, and Given the fact that Leslie is leaving, we're going to be at least a few months without anybody in charge of this. Um, and it's, to me, it's, it's inexcusable that, the, that we don't, that it'll take us that long with the governor's office to the budget office to get this position approved. And it, it is something that if we want to make this a priority, we really need to make it a priority by putting it into our budget proposal in the fall. Um, and it's not a huge amount of money we're talking about here, you know, but we, uh, we do need to have some dedicated source of resources uh, if we want to move this pathway along. Right now, it's, uh, it's going to be difficult, but we, Leslie's done yeoman work on doing it on a shoestring, but I think we're, and we have great volunteers. This mm -hmm. committee has been fabulous, uh, but we need, we need more than that. So when, when it comes up in state aid or other issues. Mm -hmm. I hope we will add this as a budget priority. Thank you. 
Um, let me just make sure I have, first of all, Leslie, really, I know that um, this opens up the next part of your art journey. <laughs> And uh, we really want to make sure that we want to acknowledge all, the, all your hard work. Um, thank you for all of that on behalf of, of the regions and the department. And know that you're not going to be too far um, as we continue to advance this work because a lot of times people who have made this kind of commitment uh, want to see it to the next level. So. Th there. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I have everybody. Uh, Kathy Cashin is next. Uh, Re um, Regent Cashin is next. Regent Reyes. Regent Johnston. Regent Chin. Regent Odekirk. Regent Midler. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. I'll just if if what I am asking is not asked by someone else, then I'll go. Otherwise, okay. I'll... We'll put you in as a pinch hitter. Uh, any <laughs> anybody else that I left out? No. Okay, Regent Cashin, take it away. Thank you, Chancellor. So I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy about this. I know, what was it, four years ago, five years ago, we were talking about tests, mm -hmm. talk, you know, formal tests on, on everything in terms of a knowledge base with respect to the arts. So my questions are, just to get a, a further, deepen my understanding of your presentation, is a performance, can that be considered the assessment? Mm -hmm. uh, the CGO includes I a have a couple, so. <laughs> okay. May I? Should I yeah. wait till you're done? Yeah, yeah it's going to be brief, so I don't want to take up your time. Okay. It, is the evaluation of a performance considered the assessment? Can it be a collaborative project, or does it have to be individual in order to get you know, a score? If there's a string quartet that, that uh, performs, are they collaboratively rated? Is that possible? Uh, can a research project on, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci be incorporated as, I love the idea of portfolio assessments because of the work and the in-depth knowledge, and also it motivates students tremendously in my experience, everything I've seen on it. But, so those questions I basically, can the performance be the assessment? Because one of the criteria is data-driven. So. If, so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the research proposal in the area of the arts. Is that also incorporated? And collaborative projects, like a, a, a medley of um, in, you know, musicians or an orchestra. I mean, how, how will this work? How will this flesh out? OK, the CGL includes a performance assessment component. And uh, it, it could be uh, collaborative, although each um, performer in an ensemble would have to be evaluated inde independently as an uh, uh, contributor to the ensemble. So, um, and the uh, arts assessment experts, our national colleagues, are developing the materials that are used for the criteria for this, this um, capstone project would be developed with the student's interests driven and their uh, arts educators using these parameters developed by the Blue Ribbon Commission. So there's um, materials for them to work from in developing their project. Now, what was the other one? Data-driven. Um, How would you incorporate data-driven? Oh, I'm I'll, not sure. Okay. Uh, Katie can speak to that probably best, or, and Robert. The, <laughs> the, the collection of the uh, performances are videotaped and the the data actually comes from the performance and the criteria the the rubrics that are are utilized within the assessment produce criteria that then produce the data that teachers would use or administrators would use in order to forward the work being done in the classroom so there's a link there's there are there's criteria with rubrics that are all set up that would then move instruction and learning in the classroom. Um, so it fits perfectly with data-driven instruction, and uh, it has a creativity and freedom that perhaps we haven't seen in some time. Thank you. Next, uh, Regent Reyes. Thank you. I wanted to know uh, if you used uh, the portfolio consortium of schools 
in terms of your review of uh, best practices relating to the arts in the, the use of portfolio uh, and uh, what lessons were learned. I, I'm assuming, but I, maybe I shouldn't, that they were part of the Blue Ribbon Committee or had representation. Uh, so that's my first question. And my second question goes to your slide about confirmation of the appropriateness. Uh, under the conclusion, you talk about problems. Besides uh, money, uh, availability of arts personnel, and I think something relating to management, and I don't know if that's people in an assessment department within curriculum, what that refers to. If you it could refers explain. to both curriculum and assessment. Uh, we have very limited capacity, but we're um, limping along with what we have. Um, so the <coughs> back to your first question, I'm not aware of a uh, portfolio consortium. Are you of my portfolio yes. team? I, I am. It's Katie. Is. It's it's an it, that the consortium is an is an older uh, work uh, that has actually from SCDN's work and from. Uh, Giselle Martin Kniep, and much of the that history um, does uh, actually inform the work that we have done with CGEL and actually with the IAAP committee and the further development. I'm sure we would welcome it. Should everything be be funded and supported by the board, <laughs> um, we would definitely welcome that type of work to continue Let's, statewide. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's hard to interrupt. You. It's okay. Uh, I don't think that's the consortium he's speaking to. I think oh. he's, he's talking about the 39 schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. New York City, mm -hmm. well, New York City, I, I think Rochester has, mm -hmm. you know, he's talking about the, cons the, the consortium schools are very specific mm -hmm. to doing the work with mm -hmm. portfolio. So what, you know, I think um, that's what he's speaking to. Because they've done the work around the issue of portfolio. I think it, at it, least yeah. 10 years. Um, much more. And so, much not, more. And so yeah. there's a whole yeah, we'll, wealth of information, and I'm wondering to what extent the work of the Blue Ribbon Committee and its subcommittees took advantage and used whatever lessons and best practices. No, we obviously have some dots to connect here. Right. We do, yes. I think that the, the conversation um, has been that because they do the work, their umbrella is a portfolio approach. I think this is um, obviously, as you said, lessons learned. I think that, that the next step as they move forward and advance this, Regent Tillis has just stated that they will reach out mm -hmm. and that they mm -hmm. will make sure that the lessons about how they use portfolios will be incorporated into it. Yeah, Nan, Nan and I were privileged to see a, a portfolio presentation in the arts at one of these schools. and. Um, we will be using that, but we're not. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay, yeah. excellent. In response to the question of the uh, the lack of availability of arts personnel, how big a problem or issue is that? Uh, some of that depends on the waiver. <laughs> um, I will be retiring, and I have restructured the Blue Ribbon Commission, as you saw. Uh, to move forward in my absence. So this can just move. The Blue Ribbon is ready to roll um, uh, with the steering committee and my national experts to um, take these next steps. That's all outlined in the reports. They know what they're going to do. They're just waiting for funding at this point. Um, I thought you were making the point of arts teachers and not enough of them around. Or am I missing the point? Uh, no, we've had a lot of arts teachers on the commission and supporting this work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I th okay. So th these are two different. You're talking about uh, the, um, do we have a lack of, of in in the in the, in the certification of art teachers or in the feel of art teachers? Uh, it is a um, uh, an area that has been in some ways decimated by. Uh, some of the focus on other content areas, we will, you know, we have to acknowledge up front, right? Um, I think what this particular um, Blue Ribbon panel and this, uh, in terms of the SED, 
has put in a, a major um, initiative to create this pathway. And I think the pathway in itself is a beginning step to uh, acknowledge in terms of the public space that there is a, a need for this and it is extremely important to make sure that the arts are an integral part of the whole, educating the whole child. So I think we've gone, um, uh, we've certainly have uh, made a commitment both as a Board of Regents and as a department um, in saying that not only do we need the teaching staff, but we also need the initiatives, we need the, this pathway, we need ways of elevating uh, the arts into a partnership um, as part of the educational process okay. for children. Uh, just, just to add quickly, um, there, there, we, this discussion was held several times during the commission, early commission meetings. It is very possible that we are going to need more arts educators. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're mm -hmm. going yeah. to need mm -hmm. to have processes mm -hmm. for shared teaching, perhaps, Correct. in mm -hmm. schools and even um, virtual um, programs where in certain parts of the state where it's going to be very difficult to have all five areas of the right. arts. So uh, that has yet to be seen. The implementation has to be seen, but this has to be approved first, and mm -hmm. then we mm -hmm. will move on how to, how to implement. Thank you. And Could offering you? an arts pathway will help um, drive reform in our K through eight arts programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to add you to the list. Okay. Uh, Regent Johnson. I have a number of comments. First of all, great work, really great work. And mm -hmm. it sets a pathway for how standards should be developed and how assessments should be put in place. And you're to be congratulated for doing that. Uh, there is something missing in the way in which we are educating our public. We talk, the kids are going to start this week taking their ELA exams in math the following week. We do not emphasize the arts as integral to uh -huh. our schools, our, child's, our children's education. We don't make it a statement, and I'm not even sure what policies we have in place that put this on the table. Uh -huh. We, I think, have an obligation to help everyone understand that in a country as diverse as we are, one of the most universal ways to communicate would be through the arts. Mm -hmm. So while I understand, and I want to get to the portfolio and the assessment in a minute, here's a problem that I help, I'm wondering if you're grappling with. We have learned by watching the data that children who live in high poverty schools tend to score at the low end of the scale. Whatever we give them, that's where they show up at in large numbers. We have no idea what talents exist in the arts that we've never been able to tap. And I think you would find a shock in terms of the levels of performance. But there's a budgetary problem here. Where do we eliminate arts and music in the high poverty schools? So my question for you and for Roger, what are the budget implications? What are the implications for mandating that all children have this experience? And how do we ensure that there are actually two pathways in a school system? One is the pathway to the option of the uh, plus one, and the other is the pathway to being a consumer of the arts and demonstrating that you understand the representation it offers for uh, looking at as a lens for looking at our world. And I think both are important. But I do understand that we need to ensure that children have a chance to get to this pathway. And I don't, we used to have recorders, remember that? Everyone had a recorder in the third grade. I don't even think we give recorders to kids anymore. So some of those concerts were unbelievable. Uh, but a recorder taught a third grader a lot about music. So how do we bring the arts into the schools? How do we budget for this? What policies do we need? How do we get the world to understand the importance of the arts? So I know that's a big one, but I feel so strongly about this. And I think we're missing something. By, I'm just thinking about a conversation I had with the community last night. Even I didn't bring up the arts, and I, but I did donate to the arts. I, uh, as part of the, you should know, as part of the presentation to me, I donated money to the center for the arts. Mm -hmm. Money had to go for the arts for, for children. Because I feel so strongly about what it means. So how do we make sure this happens for all children? And not just the schools where there is wealth and, uh, and education. Now, and I know it's a tough question, but, I, but we're missing the boat. I think if we were to go into high poverty mm -hmm. schools and bring this in, we would suddenly find, look how these kids can perform. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and what the translation is to their academic subjects because they're feeling so good about their ability to perform. So it's a very, very high priority for me. Eugene Johnson, that goes, <clears throat> goes back to, that goes to the heart of the issue of yeah. equity again. So, yeah. thank you. So it's a lot to put on your plate, but to do this means we need to do it for all children, not just those who mm -hmm. live in high wealth mm -hmm. communities. We need to figure out how to make that happen. Yeah, we're doing thank that. you, Eugene Johnson. Uh, Eugene Chen? Thank you, Leslie, and the uh, committee for a very thorough and comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, as you're presenting um, about the purposes and the benefits of using CGEL, there's a buzz among us because it's so exciting that we are moving in the direction of performance assessments. Um, I know there are implications for, I, in, in the implementation of this, in the development and the implementation. So my question is, will this become an obstacle for us moving forward? And what do you foresee as the timeline in which this will actually be mm -hmm. out in the field? Well, we had a timeline to bring the CGEL uh, to the field in the spring of 2019, but because of the funding delay, we have missed that mark. Um, I do think that um, uh, the best ways to uh, bring this to attention is to demonstrate uh, those students who have s struggles getting through the other regents' exams and how an arts pathway opens up worlds to them. Give, sh show the world how these kids can uh, speak this other language and um, excel in an area that isn't an option for them at this point in time. Um, did I answer your question? Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, a bunny issue, <laughs> bottom uh, line. Yeah. And, and that's, so I'm, I'm concerned about that because as we're trying to move towards um, the direction of developing more of a performance-based assessment mm -hmm. system, we're going to run into the same obstacle when we develop an assessment for the science standards as well. Mm -hmm. So it, there, to me, is that I'm not sure what the answer is, except that we need more money and more resources to do so. But I think that needs to be you know, kind of surfaced every time we have this conversation. Without the resources, this does not go forward. Um, the other question I have is um, you have a, quite a few districts that are, have volunteered for this project, um, but um, it seems that New York City um, is absent from that list of uh, volunteers. Is there a reason? why we did not have any districts, I mean, any schools in New York City that didn't uh, come forward? Well, we just didn't have them on the panel volunteering. <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, we did go chase around and shake the bushes to get some uh, districts across state. The so, Leslie, is that a nice way of saying they did not come forth and volunteer? Mm -hmm. I guess. We did do a lot of work with New York City and one of the other options we did not choose to move forward with was the New York City um, Arts Exit Exams. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with those. They are uh, very similar to the CGEL. They are um, district developed, so we have regulations in place that eliminated those for use as a 4 plus 1. There was some discussion about taking those assessments to another level, a regional level, and uh, revising them so that they wouldn't be caught in that regulation. However, that never moved forward either. Well, I think um, there's another opportunity sure. with, you know, with the new, there's a change in leadership. And I hope um, that we can engage um, in, in those conversations as, as we move forward. I have Regent Odekirk, Midler, very short, and closing, Regent Young. was you reignited what's kind of dormant within us, but occasionally we have conversations about a lot of the related topics. So I have a couple of things, and I will try to be quick. Um, is there any involvement? I remember years ago, I sent some students, and they went to the 
summer school for music program at Saratoga. Is that still alive and well? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is one yes. of the schools in the New York State Absolutely. Summer School of the Arts. We have an update that we give to each year. It's uh, expanding. It's doing great. And um, we mm -hmm. have incredible programs around the state. So we'll, we'll be giving that to you again. Good. Um, so I wanted to make sure that there was a connection there and then we could keep that alive if possible. And I would ask the Chancellor and the Commissioner if we could, in light of the turnover of you going in some other related direction, whatever that is, you will surely be, be missed. But I don't want this ball to get dropped. Could we make a note that we revisit this, mm -hmm. knowing that we've got to go through leadership transition, but this is too important and relates to too many other things. There's a commercial on TV right now, and it's a workplace, and this young man is supposedly working, then all of a sudden he rolls into a kind of a bebop musical thing and adds dance to it, and I thought, that's one of those kids that, that we are not reaching. I don't know who put that together, but I'm with Judith. There's so many kids that would be picked up by some of this that don't relate to some of the other typical things that we do with our students in our schools. So, no, I just wanted to reassure you that the ball will not get dropped. Okay. We're going to continue moving mm -hmm. forward as we have for the last few years. It will continue. It might move a little slower, but it'll move. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very, uh, very quickly, Regent uh, Midler, very quickly. Uh, Regent Collins, and we've got to close uh, with Regent Young. I'm very aware that money is always an issue, so mm -hmm. I'd like to remove that as a consideration and ask some general questions, yep. unless you go and print the money, which I will turn my head the other way. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about how we ensure exposure of all five areas. I know that in elementary schools, the predominance of Board of Ed is to cut, reduce, or, or um, redefine the delivery of services in the arts because they think that elementary students need more reading, writing, and math. Well, I disagree. So I'd like to look to see that we mandate these five discipline areas that all children are exposed. You don't know if you can dance if you've never been given the experience. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to encourage that. I know you're working on it, but that's... It is mandated K through eight. Mm -hmm. K through six. Yeah, and not always followed, so I'm just Absolutely. looking to put yes. some teeth in that. <laughs> and then the other part is, I'm not clear, except that you mentioned it yeah. orally. Um, when the choice of the specific area of focus begins, uh, you know, whether somebody could be in music and dance, does that count, or is it only one area that you go to get your, your capstone performance, whether it can be combined? And in addition, whether or not we can look at giving external credit. Lots of kids join the chorus through church or community choruses. Could we, in fact, count that with some coordination? Could we, in fact, count? I know there are many dance groups that are around. Mm -hmm. Now, I, this could be a money issue for parents who can, in fact, pay for it. But it also exists outside without funds. So I'd like to see that included. OK. Thank you. Thank you. First question, remind me. Oh, uh, ensure <laughs> exposure in all five areas of the arts and media, not just one. That's not, you can do that. No, the other one, one was that. that when you choose the area of focus. Oh, okay. So think of um, the arts education programming as a pyramid. Okay. We have requirements that they have experience or instruction in all four disciplines. We oh. haven't quite lifted media yeah. arts okay. into that, but we're, that's in process. That they have that for all four at the bottom, and at the middle level, they have to have two visual and media arts. New York City has a waiver. They can do all four at the middle level. And then at the high school, they are narrowing it to their choice of one discipline. We do have a five unit sequence in uh, fine arts, which can include a mixture of the disciplines. Oh. Second question? Oh, that's good that's enough it. for me. No, there was a second oh, one. Oh, the external credit? Uh, yes, that was one of the recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Commission. It was uh, decided that that was sort of problematic in terms of evaluating the yeah. programs and. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was not lifted. Well, Thank that's you. a concern I have with the impoverished Thank students. Okay. Thank you, Regent Reg Collins. Quickly, um, New York City may not have volunteered, but I just wanted to note that for Western New York, from my eight county area, <laughs> of the seven, three came from my area. <laughs> 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 All right, Buffalo is in 
in the house. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo is, I just want the audience to know, Buffalo is in the house. Yeah, right. Okay. Buffalo okay. is right. definitely in the house. Thank, thank you. Regent Young, now yeah. on behalf of New York City, please. <laughs> so what what I would like to do is really commend you, your leadership and, and your team, the committee, uh, for the presentation. Um, I would say that when we've talked about assessments in the past, um, we spend an enormous amount of time uh, trying to deal with this question, confirmation of the appropriateness of the assessment. And I think um, what you presented today, my colleague asked if the other consortium was part of your group. I actually think you should be part of their group. <laughs> um, you, you, well, look, I mean, for just as a point of fact, of uh, We've never had a presentation like this on this topic. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a model. Mm -hmm. The other point that I would make, um, it really underscores uh, <clears throat> what Regent Johnson said. Um, investments in leadership matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's what I continue to hear. Um, the other, the last point is one of the reasons why we don't ever get to it is that James Comer said 60 years ago that learning is a function of all the developmental pathways. Mm -hmm. That cognitive development is inextricably connected to all of the other developmental pathways. Amen. We can't piecemeal this. Amen. And I think the policy yep. statement that needs to be made is just that. How do we define learning? And it should be done in that context. And I think you've shown us the way. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have one question. I know. Will we take this regional? I can ask. I don't know if this goes to Roger or to Leslie. But will you be going out into the state in different regions where they're asking for these presentations? Yes. yes. Because I know so, we want one in the Lower Hudson Valley. Okay. So, so I, I just want to point out um, we've been focusing on the assessment part of this, mm -hmm. but I, on the very beginning part was the work that's been done on. Um, making presentations across the state on the standards that were approved. And the work that, that work has been done by um, teachers who are out in the schools and they're great leaders in um, getting the information about the new standards, which obviously before we do an assessment, we need to make sure everybody understands what the, the standards are and can help us in the development of that. So just so that you connect the things that have been happening, we've been putting out a number of, of um, opportunities in, in our staff to see how we can strengthen partnerships that exist between our school systems and the cultural institutions in their communities. And so this is a perfect place for our cultural institutions become leaders in working with us on development of the standards mm -hmm. and expansion of the standards and really a transition into um, making sure that they are followed and that they are the guideposts as we move forward. And the second thing I want to point out is the portfolio option, and you're going to hear later, we're going to be talking about ESSA, and all of you will remember that we included in there the work that ultimately we want to get to portfolios as an option, whether this is an option in the arts, whether it's in some other content area. We need to develop the kind of work that's been done on this particular assessment. The CGEL that has been in place, and I would agree with Regent Young, um, looking at how you have to review an assessment for um, reliability and uh, validity and fairness is in a critical piece. All that should be included in any kind of assessment that we put together. And it, that takes time, and that's where it takes the funding. So uh, I think we're on the pathway. I appreciate the work that's been done, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, and Leslie, uh, you've heard it from other people, but let me say as a commissioner, I want to thank you very much because this work would not have gotten done without the leadership of Leslie. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you,
would like to uh, remind you all that uh, to submit your understanding of performance assessment in the CGL, go to our arts assessment page and look at the uh, assessments re or experts report and all the information there on the CGL. Okay, before we conclude uh, and go upstairs, I, um, I do want to share that it's, it's important um, that our conversations in terms of the arts continue because this is how, you know, obviously we reach uh, and we send a, a, a powerful message uh, the importance of the arts and taking their rightful place at the table um, with a lot of the other work. So um, definitely thank you so much for this amazing piece and keeping in mind that also as we look at this, that the issue of cultural responsiveness in terms of the arts um, also becomes a, a part of the fabric so that we embrace various forms of and various cultures and how the art connects uh, the different cultures uh, and enriches this so-called um, culture that has different, um, different representations. So on behalf of, of uh, the entire board, once again to the entire panel, to Leslie, Thank you, and we conclude, and we will, well, oh. There will be two. a continuation of this discussion a little bit this afternoon at Cultural Ed, mm -hmm. when we talk about how the cultural institutions around the state are going to be right. working with, with us on, on P12, so stay tuned. Uh, yes. Vice Chancellor? We, we just when you're done, uh, Madam move. Chancellor, I just want to encourage everyone to move upstairs quickly. For P12, we had a great presentation just now. We didn't want to cut that off. But I do want to remind everybody that we have a hard stop before lunch. Thank you.